Better? There you go. Great. Wonderful. Uh, floor is all yours. <laughs> okay, so can you see my mouse? Yep, yep. yep. Okay, very good. All right, thank you guys for uh, inviting me to talk about this. Um, I haven't talked about this for a while, but uh, we are actively working on it still. So it's an interesting subject. I'm happy to revisit it by giving a presentation. Um, so, and I will try to stick to the 30 minutes as best as possible. Please uh, maybe just cut me off or tell me, give me a minute warning or something and I'll wrap it up. Um, so uh, I should first thank uh, Moore Foundation and NSF for funding this work, and this is work done at Maryland uh, University of Maryland and our Quantum Materials Center. So um, I won't go through everyone here, but the main people involved in the work are my former student, Chris Eckberg, who really drew a lot of this work, and I'll, I'll mention him as we go, and former student, Daniel Campbell, uh, who helped, as well as several, several other people doing experiments and so on. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, so I'm seeing partials uh, screen. I don't know if anybody else is. Yeah, that's uh, the case. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Seems like it's a, it's a shifted on the on the left hand side. Okay. Let me just. Okay. Give me one second and let me try to uh, second screen only. Okay. Is this my? Uh, yeah. Presenter mode. Okay, hold on a second. It was okay on the title slide and then, yeah, and then on the... Oh, boy, okay. Uh... Sorry about this. This is a presenter mode, yeah. Yeah, sorry, this is uh, such a pain. Okay, while it's thinking, I'll just thank my collaborators. <laughs> Uh, Jeff Lynn, uh, we were doing some neutron scattering early on and, and uh, saw some very unusual uh, uh, peak splitting at the phase transition. Is this still not? I don't know if it's still, yeah, okay, let's see. Maybe it's still thinking to the presenter mode. Okay, you know what? Um, I'm just going to do this. That's great. And, uh, yeah, that looks good. Yeah. Okay, is that better? Mm -hmm. Yep. Looks fantastic. That's good. Yeah. All right. And one day I will figure this out. Okay. Um, okay. Lots of collaborators. Uh, just to mention, of course, uh, Peter Avamonte, who we did some x-ray work with you will present after me so that's great um, and then several other people who have uh, over the last couple of years have been exploring this material with various techniques um, and then Raphael who uh, helped us with some of the theory on the pneumatic phase and is continuing to work on that as well okay so everyone's familiar with pneumatic crystals you all watch TV presumably and you know you, you know that your LCD screen, has nematicity in it, right? And uh, so you're reminded every night of that nematicity. But in uh, in our uh, our more isolated world of superconductors, etc., we're also familiar with you know fairly recent appearance of pneumatic uh, order and fluctuations, etc. In uh, two very famous superconducting families, of course, the cuprates and the iron nictides, and you know, it's still an ongoing subject to understand what's the role of pneumatic order, pneumatic fluctuations and pairing, for instance. That's one of the main uh, motivations we had in, in doing our study. 
Um, so, uh, and then of course, you know, the, this, this uh, seminal work by Ian Fisher's group on developing this very nice technique of uh, elastoresistivity to study uh, nematicity or nematic order or nematic fluctuations directly using a fairly straightforward technique has really opened the field and several of us, you know, have exploited this exact technique to do such studies. And this is what I'll show today. And of course, the, the work that Ian's group did was on, uh, um, Jun Hao in particular, was on the iron nictides, which you know, really opened our eyes to the role of pneumatic fluctuations in the system. And that, you know, that, that's been explored in several variations of the iron superconductors, which I'll just flash here. And uh, you know, one, of, one of the key things about pneumatic order or nematicity is understanding its role in, in, in the presence of other orders and other phase transitions. And so, you know, um, when a crystal breaks rotational symmetry, there's in essence three different types of properties that are affected uh, that break the same, the corresponding symmetries in you know, structural order, orbital, and spin. And usually we're familiar with the sort of trivial case where structure will change its symmetry and then the other two follow along. But, you know, there are cases now known where something like orbital order leads the way and the other ones follow along. And this is the non-trivial case that we're discussing here. Uh, and then the, the motivation, as I said, is to understand the role of this type of fluctuation in pairing. And this has been explored for a few years now in particular by Steve Kivelson's group and Sam Letterer, who, who has been continuing to study uh, the effect of pneumatic fluctuations on superconductivity, what, I'll, whether it's driving the pairing or it's enhancing the pairing. And that's the latter is what we think is happening in this nickel arginine system. And there's key questions, of course. So, you know, how much can TC be enhanced? Uh, the Q equals zero symmetry, you know, which is unusual, an unusual type of fluctuation symmetry to think about in pairing. Uh, and then the role of dimensionality. These are all questions that still need to be answered in, in, gen, in general. Um, so a long time ago, actually, we were looking at this nickel arsenide system um, for other reasons, because it's, okay, first of all, it's, it, it, it was explored right after the discovery of the iron superconductors in particular, because if you look at the resistivity, for instance, of barium nickel arsenic, it looks identical to some of the iron nictides. But in fact, it's not. It's a, it undergoes a structural transition, and there's no magnetic order. Um, and so actually, this transition, this first order transition, is structural in nature. And it goes from a tetragonal phase, which is the same as the iron nictides, to this triclinic phase. It's very unusual, uh, first, very unusual transition to go from tetragonal to the lowest symmetry phase at low temperature, but that's what happens. Um, and it is also a superconductor. So a TC below about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 Kelvin, it becomes superconducting. And this was studied uh, fairly quickly, for instance, by Los Alamos, the Ronning and company. And they fairly quickly concluded that at least the, the, the nature of the pairing is at the very least a fully gapped superconductor as shown by thermal conductivity and so on specific heat. And so it was kind of dismissed as something not very interesting. Uh, of course, there's, an, there's the, the strontium variant of this material. You can also make strontium nickel to arsenic too. It's tetragonal, shows no phase transitions, and it looks completely boring. You know, the resistivity looks metallic. Um, it's also a superconductor, ironically, but in with a, almost the same TC. And uh, it also looks fully gapped in conventional at least according to thermal transport and specific heat. And so, you know, one might conclude fairly readily that TC is the same, perhaps the phonons are exactly the same, and, and it's just a BCS superconductor. Although you have to remember that one is tri triclinic and one is tetragonal, so it's a bit unusual. So early on, we sought to explore this um, transition between the two to see what happens in between, so something interesting happened. Um, for instance, the C axis changes quite dramatically. It changes by 10% from one side to the other in the tetragonal phase. Of course, there's the triclinic transition that occurs. 
So, um, and yeah, I should remind you that the triclinic phase, um, you know, all this is the lowest symmetry phase. So all the angles are off 90 degrees, all the bonds, uh, A, B, and C uh, are all different, you know, so it's, it's the, it's, it's the most monstrous tetragonal phase you can think of. And uh, so we did several studies and here's you know, sort of the answer to start with. We studied, for instance, electron doping the nickel system. And we found, for instance, that um, TC gets enhanced as you add cobalt into the system and you suppress this triclinic phase. And this was known through, through other systems by uh, uh, Nohara's group and company in Japan, where they studied, uh, for instance, copper and phosphorus substitution. Although those systems, uh, I can comment later if somebody asks, those systems show a sort of a first order transition from one phase to the other. And then the strontium system we studied, and you know, here's the one of the answers that TC gets enhanced quite a bit also in this system. And I'll explore the second one a little bit more. So Peter will talk uh, presumably a little bit more in detail about the charge order in the system, but just to introduce it, um, the structural transition that occurs at about 135 Kelvin is very abrupt, first order. You can see tetragonal phase to triclinic. And what was found by Peter's group is that actually there's also a charge order coming along for the ride. Not only does it appear in the triclinic phase, abruptly, but it, it starts to appear in the tetragonal phase. And these are two different charge orders. And it's, it's even richer than that, which Peter will elaborate on. Um, and so just to show, for instance, um, the two charge order phases that were discovered, uh, the triclinic phase happens at 135 Kelvin. This, there's an incommensurate charge order that slowly grows from higher temperature and peaks just before the triclinic transition, it dies, and then uh, there's a commensurate charge order that builds the red curve here uh, in the triclinic phase. And originally we thought, we, we, the original data showed that we thought that this uh, incommensurate order was breaking with the trigonal symmetry, but Peter's gonna show, I'm sure, the fact that it, it actually doesn't, has a 4Q, uh, uh, has a multi brillion zone uh, uh, modulation, which was, actually hard to see in the first experiment. Okay, so the experiments we did in Maryland were this classic elastic resistance experiment where you take a crystal, glue it on a piezo stack and uh, strain it. And you know, you measure the strain and you do all the usual things, which I won't go into now to make sure you're doing it properly. And <clears throat> you can do it two ways. <clears throat> So, and this is to measure different symmetries, actually three different ways you can do, but um, there's limitations on the, the, the way the crystals are uh, grown and, and, and the shape and size. So we do two of them. Uh, and this is the classic orientation of the crystal on the piezo stack, for instance, in the iron-based superconductor studies. This is the first experiment we did. And my student, he built the apparatus, did the experiment, did the measurement, and basically we found that it was zero. And we said, okay, let's move on. And uh, you know, let's study something else. And if, a few months later, he happened to just on his own initiative, measure the other direction, which is the, the B1G direction, where you have two crystals and, and there's other ways to do this, but this is the way he did it. And lo and behold, he actually found a huge pneumatic susceptibility that, uh, that grows as you approach the triclinic transition. And so I was very happy to see that, of course, you know, very surprised. And uh, not only that, but the magnitude of it, if I go back one, compare, this is about 60 in these units of uh, the susceptibility. It's the same, same order of magnitude as the iron superconductors. So it was very nice to see that and very surprising. You know, we had no idea we were gonna see this kind of thing. Um, just to compare the two, this is one experiment, this is an older one. But you see that the, the two symmetries probe you know, the two different, uh, the two experiments probe the two different symmetries, and certainly it's the B1G that, uh, that showed a large signal. And that was surprising because the iron system shows the large signal in the B2G. And you can see here, just a, this is a fancy way to show that you know, there's a rotation 
of the response in the two systems. And so in, just to remind you in the iron systems, the B2G uh, pneumatic amplitude is at least most likely tied to the magnetic correlations along the 110 direction. Whereas in the nickel system, there is no magnetism. And so the question is what is related to this? And you know, this is ongoing study, perhaps it's charge order, perhaps it's some orbital ordering or, or uh, susceptibility to orbital ordering and so on. Okay. Um, in these experiments, the other thing we found in barium nickel arsenic was that, so here's sort of the raw data of this experiment. You measure the resistance response as you apply strain on the x-axis. Zero is here, so you go through zero. And it's basically just like a magnetic uh, susceptibility measurement. You measure a slope, and then the slope is the susceptibility. Now, the thing here is that you see with your bare eye that there's these loops in some of the data. And a loop is a, just like in magnetization, it's a hysteretic loop, which signifies some type of domain structure, which signifies some type of order. Now, this is the pneumatic response. So we were surprised to see this, and we concluded essentially that this seems to be tied to some kind of pneumatic order, not just a fluctuation. And it has a temperature dependence. You see that at higher temperatures, like in the black, there's no uh, hysteresis, it's just a flat line. You go up and down as much as you want, and it's a slope. Whereas as you approach, you know, basically below about 50, 150 Kelvin, you start to see this loop opening up. And you can traverse this loop as much as you want, and it has hysteretic behavior. Um, so uh, this region, as I said, is about from 155 Kelvin down to the triclinic phase. And you can see uh, the, the, it's in this range here. Interestingly, this is roughly speaking also the range, well, actually almost identically, also the range where the charge order appears, this incommensurate charge order. So charge order onsets gradually, and this pneumatic order onsets gradually. And in fact, you can plot them together. This is in the paper um, shown in the red and blue, you can plot the width of the hysteresis. It's just some measure of the order that you have, along with the square of the intensity of the charge order peaks in the, in the red. And they actually track each other quite nicely. So it shows a linear relationship between these two. And this is to be, we're still understanding what, what's happening here, for instance, you know, the, the, there's new evidence that the charge order, as I said, is, is not breaking the trigonal symmetry. So we have to understand the symmetries that are being broken by these orders and how they're coupled, because that, that will help us understand the uh, connection between the two. And then the, the pneumatic susceptibility, you see that it actually grows, starts to grow before this order onsets and, uh, and then peaks, of course. So, this actually, you know, you may look like a Curie-Weiss behavior, but it's not. It's actually a little bit different. So, and it's shown here. And now, what I'm showing is the progression of this pneumatic susceptibility in order as a function of strontium substitution. And so, here's the phase diagram showing the triclinic structural order being suppressed as you add strontium, uh, as you replace barium with strontium. So at some point, about 70%, there's, there's a cutoff and it's completely tetragonal. There's no triclinic order. Um, and then as you go along this x-axis, you see that this, the pneumatic susceptibility, uh, its growth gets suppressed in temperature as well, and its, its magnitude gets suppressed until basically at x equals 1, the strontium end, there's nothing. It's just completely flat. Now there's some structure in here and you can look at this more carefully. And for instance, this is scrunched down just to compare scales, but in the pure barium end of this is the data and the light gray area is where we see this pneumatic order the hysteresis. And you see that that actually progresses as well. By the time you get to 0.6 or so, there's no hysteresis. And I'll show you that there's also no charge order above the triclinic transition. And that's the point where also this pneumatic susceptibility becomes more Curie Weiss like. In fact, the dashed dash line is a Curie Weiss fit. Until finally you get rid of the triclinic phase and there's still a growth, but then it gets suppressed as you go down. 
until you have nothing on this end. Okay, so it's a rich system. Um, if you put this, oops, if you, oh yeah, I should point out that at this point here, 0.75, and I can come back to it if we have a few minutes, there's actually not a sharp peak and there's no order that occurs here. Nothing we've measured has indicated any change, any kind of phase transition, but there's a broad maximum in dramatic susceptibility. And we believe this may be some kind of glassy behavior or something, but it's a bit hard to get at and we're still studying it. Um, so if you put all the pneumatic susceptibility data onto a color plot, um, along with the other data, this is what it looks like. So the color uh, contours here are indicating the magnitude of the pneumatic susceptibility. And then the phase boundaries show, for instance, the blue dots are the structural transition. Uh, the, these squares and circles here are where the pneumatic and the charge order onset. So red dot is the charge order and the blue squares are the pneumatic the order is indicated by the hysteresis onset. So you see they track each other quite well and they both disappear around 0.6. And there's no, so there's no charge order above the triclinic phase here and no pneumatic order. So they're strongly tied, they're very closely tied together. And then as I said at 0.7, you get cut off and there's only a pneumatic, very strong pneumatic susceptibility that actually peaks before it starts to go down as you approach zero. And then that dies off and then there's basically nothing. So, you know, even, even removing all the complications of what's going on here, a very rich phase diagram. Basically, I, 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 in hindsight, we should have, for our paper, we should have focused just on this part here. It's all tetragonal. There's no triclinic distortion. There's no charge order. There's no pneumatic order to be seen. There's just pneumatic susceptibility and there's superconductivity. So I'll show you what happens now in the superconducting state as you approach, well, as, as you go around. But really, you know, this is the interesting part here because there's, it's void of any other complication. Okay. Um, I should go back here. So we, we uh, with Raphael, we developed a story to understand how this trade-off between this um, pneumatic order and fluctuation as you as you go across this phase diagram and the structural order. And he, they came up with a, a free energy model trying to understand how you might transition from a structurally driven to an electronically driven um, phase transition, structural phase transition. Um, but this is gonna be modified now that we understand that uh, the charge order is a little different than what we thought of before. So we have to work on this. So, um, so now in the last couple minutes, I'll just go through the superconducting state data and again, address this question of what happens to TC in the presence of this pneumatic order. In particular, in the absence of magnetic fluctuations, which you know, are good for superconductivity, but you know, they also complicate the understanding. So we have a nice clean system that seems to show only pneumatic fluctuations. And the question is what happens to superconductivity? Well, long story short, we see a dramatic enhancement in TC. So here's the end member um, where TC is only 0.6 Kelvin. And as we approach this uh, sort of quantum phase transition, uh, we see TC go up to as high as three and a half Kelvin, which is not a big TC, but it's six times bigger than what it is on the other side. And so for instance, you know, you can see that the superconducting super state is very well characterized, it's a bulk transition, et cetera. Uh, nice transitions and everything. Um, so as I said, you know, there's some complicated behavior on this side. Now I'm showing the TC versus X, just expanded here. You see that uh, it's very flat for quite a long range. And then there's some funny business here. And the funny business is that the resistive transition is way up here, whereas the specific heat transition is down here. So this is another story, which I can, address if we have time for questions. But as I said, if you just approach from the x equal one side, where this is a boring metal, which does nothing, and you approach this hot spot here, you see the TC grows dramatically. And, and this is what I'm saying. This growth um, goes in parallel with the, the very dramatic growth of the pneumatic susceptibility. 
So in essence, you know, this is the story right here that we're growing this and this together. It's shown by, you know, no pneumatic susceptibility, a very strong one here. And, and in parallel, we're of course looking at the superconducting state to see if there's other ways to explain the enhancement of pairing. There basically isn't. You know, the gamma doesn't change, the, the uh, density of states doesn't change, and the phonon, at least uh, according to specific heat, the phonon uh, slope, the uh, divide temperature, et cetera, does not change. So there's no evidence of just some enhancement of TC due to conventional mechanisms. So in the end, we had to conclude that it has to be due to enhancement by the pneumatic pairing. So we don't believe it's driving the pairing. We believe that for instance, if I go back at x equals one, this is an electron phonon superconductor, as far as we know. But it, it with electron with phonon driven pairing, but as you approach this hot spot here where the pneumatic susceptibility is very strong, it's enhancing the pairing. And again, that's the, the types of theory that um, Sam Letter and company have been working on to try to understand that enhancement. And we're, we're considering other experiments to try to explore that. Okay, so that's uh, that's uh, that's the talk in a nutshell. So uh, these boring low TC superconductors can sometimes be interesting. <laughs> uh, you know, don't dismiss them so easily, and be persistent. You know, this is a project I started ten years ago, probably, and uh, you know nobody wanted to ever work on it. But I said, you know, there's something interesting here. You got to go with your intuition, and uh, we found something quite interesting there. Uh, what I like about it. You know, officially, is that there's no magnetic order to be heard of in this system, um, and that you know that simplifies greatly the interpretation of, of where the enhancement and pairing is coming from, and uh, understanding the different roles of uh, the di different degrees of freedom in the system. The charge order is quite complicated and quite robust, and Peter uh, will elaborate on that in the next talk. Um, and I'm, you know, it, it's intimately tied to the pneumatic order and fluctuations, I'm sure. What role each of them plays, what drives the other is, is an open question. Uh, and then, of course, the enhancement of superconductivity is, is really one of the interesting things in the system. And so thanks for your time and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, JP. This is for this really interesting talk. Uh, I have some questions, but I guess Paul raised your hand. So Paul, you can, you can ask. Hi, JP. Uh, could you elaborate on the splitting of the transition um, in this panel B here that you alluded to earlier? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm not sure if I have a slide. No, sorry. Okay, so yeah, so as you can see, okay, everything's well behaved up to about 0.5. And then, and then we start to see a, uh, an enhancement of TC as measured by resistivity. You know, it seems to be like a dome shape here. But if you take the same sample, let's say right below this, this cutoff and measure, you know, all three types of measurements, resistivity, Meissner effect, and bulk specific heat transition, they actually show, you know, and this is in our paper, you can look up an example they show distinct onsets of the transition. You know, so these two are kind of close together, like for instance, where resistivity goes to zero, the onset of susceptibility, I think, occurs. So that, you know, that's not unusual, but the bulk transition is way down here. Now, Peter has, uh, I think we'll discuss a proposal for what might be happening here um, in terms of why there is some enhancement of a sort of filamentary type superconductivity here. And so, you know, Stay tuned for that. But once you get on this side, everything's well behaved. All the transitions are, are as they should be together in that, you know, that tracks through here. So that's, that's what we know about it so far. Great, thanks. And then Peng Chang. Yeah, so, so the, the crystal structures are identical. I mean, from 0.1 to 0.75. I mean, there's, no, there's nothing changes in the, in the, in the lattice. So, what about, yeah, the, 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 are there any- You mean in the, from, in the triclinic phase? Yeah, in the triclinic, well, not triclinic phase. I mean, on, on the left, I mean, the most boring one, you said it's a, 
It's a tetragonal. Oh, from one phase, to right? yeah, no, yeah, it's yeah, tetragonal. Yeah, yeah there's no. So it's, a, it's nothing. Nothing. There's happens. no phase transitions that we've seen here except for superconductivity. So. That's very very odd. So then then you you still see pneumatic stability change. The, the near near the pneumatic. Yes. Yeah. Now there's a subtle thing that happens at this this crossing here. And mm -hmm. Actually, that goes to the original reason we studied this. I was trying to see if there was a tetragonal collapse occurring across here, like in the iron systems. Because as I said, there's a 10% change in C. And over here, you know, the arsenics should be bonded actually, they should form dimers. Mm -hmm. Now in this system, I think that does happen here. We have some x-ray data that shows that in the paper, but it's a very subtle, very subtle transition. It's nowhere near like what happens in iron. So for instance, the tetrahedral bond angle shows some change at this point, but it's mm -hmm. not an abrupt first order gigantic transition. Are, are there any, have you looked at the uh, phono anomaly? Uh, there's no phono anomaly. I'm sorry, what? Are there any phono anomaly? Uh, compare, compare- Phonon, with, you said, or yeah, thermal? Yeah, yeah, you know, no, phonon, yeah. Lattice, lattice, I mean. No, not that we know of. Okay, thank you. To now. Um, JP, uh, I was just wondering uh, about the pneumatic order, 140 Kelvin. That, that seems like a very comparable temperature with the uh, ion case. So, so, uh, so FESE used to be the poster child of only pneumatic order, but we know that, that it has a lot of things in it. I, I was just wondering, whether uh, you mentioned neutron scattering at the beginning of your talk, whether there's any uh, knowledge about the inelastic neutron? Spectrum. Inelastic neutron. Yeah, he yeah. said he said no, right? I mean, I asked him, that, that's the phonon, right? Yeah. No, no, no. Oh. The, well. Yeah, so, so the older data, uh, the, you know, was elastic data. But I don't know, Pen Cheng, some time ago you told me you looked all over for yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. There's no magnetism. We know that. That's why we never publish anything. So there's no spectral weight whatsoever. That can no, no. I mean, we, we, we yeah, it was, it was a student, and the student had graduated. Yeah, after but, that. You know, yeah. But you know, the potassium ion to arsenic to was said to have very weak magnetism, but I think that story is still evolving. I'm just wondering whether it's interesting to go back to look at this. Well, you know, with inelastic, perhaps. I'm not mm -hmm. sure that's been done. No, no, but, but Certainly that's not the whole point. The in FESE, if you look at the inelastic spectrum, the total spectral weight in the spin sector is actually larger than barium ion to arsenic to, right? So, uh, uh -huh. one might. So, did, 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 yeah. Jeff, did Jeff do inelastic scattering on these, or, or Jeff has not? No. Okay. Okay, thank you. And he won't for another year or two. <laughs> okay. uh, Chris, okay. sorry. Christoph? Yeah, uh, yeah, very, very nice talk. Uh, I would like to just uh, mention that uh, we have very clear evidence for a two phase transitions in the nickel system. So one right at uh, sort of the incommensurate uh, uh, charge density wave where the uh, fourfold symmetry is broken. You have a, probably an orthorhombic phase before you enter the triclinic phase. Mm. So, so the, the uh, Incommensurate phase is not, it's not, I don't think is uh, uh, tetragonal. I see. Well, uh, so please, uh, yeah, let's see. Peter will have something to say. So, Christoph, is that for the end members? Or, or <laughs> can I ask, is that for which doping is that? The, the papers are in the archive if anybody's interested. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is was definitely an open question for us, you know. If there's a very subtle well, I think it's orthorhombic the, distortion, it's very, as you yeah. would expect, right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, let uh, uh, Peter can address this in his talk. Okay. At least from his perspective. And then I think it was Andre. Yes. Yeah. Uh, very, very nice talk. Um, yeah. Is there anything you could tell us about what's known about the symmetry of the superconducting state? For instance, quasi-particle interference in STM. I guess nobody had done laser ARPUS. Mm -hmm. Do we know anything about specifically inside the triclinic uh, charge density wave phase? 
Okay, uh, you're asking about the superconducting state or the Correct. the superconductor. Yeah. So you know below. Yeah, so the TC is quite low. I, I think it'd be hard to do any kind of ARPAs to study that state. STM. Um, we tried with a few people, and no no one has been able to get reproducible data yet. Mm -hmm. But that would be nice to do. And the conventional probes like thermal transport and so on. You know, I showed the end members. There's no evidence of anything other than a fully gapped system, mm -hmm. and at least via specific heat and the you know where TC is enhanced, it also looks fully gapped at least according to specific heat. So we don't see any evidence of unconventional superconductivity so far. See, and that conclusion is the same on the left and on the right of the triclinic to tetragonal transition. Yeah, in terms of it being fully gapped. Yeah. I see. So you do not see anything special happening at that point, just mainly to see changes a little bit. Correct. Okay, thanks. And I think we have Han. Yes, uh, I, ha I had nearly the same question. I wanted to know whether the, ga the gap followed TC on the right hand side. Uh, the gap, yes. Yeah. So the, at least according to specific heat, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Everything is well behaved, ECS like. But still, it's uh, strange that it changes so fast. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Because you know, to me, this is the most six. amazing you, thing about the system. But you, you say a factor six, so it's a huge effect. Yeah, that's right. So, that's right. so you see it being fully gapped uh, and uh, and regular. But still, with a change of factor six, which you attribute to to nematicity in some sense. Yeah, because there's nothing else that really changes. So you know, yeah. specific <laughs> heat is our our main probe of that. And we would like to do other experiments, for instance, thermal transport. But I don't expect. I didn't show the low temperature part of the specific heat, but it it looks. It, the, you you get the gap from the low temperature part. Uh, no, I'm talking. No, the gap I'm uh, I'm getting from just the the jump of TC, for instance. The magnitude of the jump. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, if we can take one last question from Amir, and then we'll move on to Peter's talk. Um, Amir. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was a very 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 nice talk. I have uh, a question regarding the two systems, uh, strontium nickel to arsenic to compare to the barium one. So um, have you, can you say something about the enhancement of the TC? If you dope the system in the, on, in the nickel arsenide planes with phosphorus, the TC goes up um, at the critical doping to 3.5 Kelvin, pretty similar to uh, if you dope the system on the barium side with the strontium. Do you have any idea um, why is it like that? Why are these TCs so similar, although you are doping completely in different um, uh, sites right. and, yeah. and different pressure effect? So, yes. So, uh, first of all, I don't say, I don't call it doping because they're iso isovalent substitutions. So, yeah, yes. even including phosphorus and arsenic. But so the, the difference here is really in this end of the, the phase diagram, because if I think about phosphorus substitution, which was studied by Nohara and company, if you take the end member barium uh, nickel two phosphorus two, TC is three Kelvin. So it's more like, uh, you know, if I think of this as phosphorus, the TC is flat, 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 and then it jumps up and then it's flat, you know, so once you once you cross to the uh, once you cross the phase boundary, the structural phase boundary, the TC jumps up. I don't have the data here to show, but it's that's my recollection of it. Whereas you know, as I said, this end of the phase diagram is really telling because nothing's there's no phase transition, nothing's changing except the pneumatic susceptibility. So TC starts at 0.6 and goes up to 3.5. So this is the contrast in, in the phosphorus. Substitution. Of course, I'd like to study the phosphorus substitution series as well to see if, what happens with pneumatic susceptibility. That would be fun. Okay, thank you. 
welcome. Thank you, JP, very much for this really interesting, interesting talk. I, I'm sure we'll continue the discussion even after Peter's uh, talk. So thank you very much. And if Peter, you may uh, try to share your screen. So next we have Peter Amante from uh, UIUC discussing the X-ray uh, scattering uh, studies of these systems. Did it work? Yep, perfect. Is it the right screen? Yes. <clears throat> okay, so um, I would really like to thank you guys for inviting me. I love traveling to Houston and Rice and I would wish I were there, but um, I'll do the best I can remotely. Um, I'd like to, so what I'm gonna talk about is the pyros phase, charge density wave material uh, phase that we observed in this barium nickel arsenide material. <clears throat> I need to uh, acknowledge Sang Jin Lee, who is the grad student. This is his PhD thesis. And in particular, JP Paglione for not giving up and working on this material for 10 years and introducing it to me. I apologize in, for not taking an interest earlier. Um, okay, so uh, I guess this series is about uh, panictide iron arsenide superconductors. So you've probably seen these pictures a lot. So this is the structure. The high temperature phase is I4, M I4 MMM, and there's a superconducting dome and antiferromagnetism with the tetragonal the orthorhombic phase transition. So you've seen all that a lot of times, I assume, by now. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is this nickel analog, barium nickel to arsenic 2, the JP just showed you, but I'm going to focus more on the structure. I have some data about um, the tet possible tetragonal phase versus triclinic phase near the phase boundary that I can share um, if as a supplement slide. At any rate, this is the structure. It's identical to the iron arsenide 122 materials. The lattice parameters are a little different. C is a bit smaller and A and B are a bit larger, but otherwise it has the same high temperature structure. It's I4 MMM body centered tetragonal but when you cool, it doesn't go orthorhombic, it goes triclinic at a triclinic transition of 136 Kelvin, which is slightly first order. And the triclinic space group is P1 bar. So that's the lowest symmetry you can have that still has body centered symmetry to it. So the only lower symmetry is P1 is minus bar. So, and as you heard, this material is superconducting with a TC of 0.7 Kelvin. So it's an interesting analog to the iron arsenides. So um, if you dope it with cobalt, then the phase diagram looks a lot like iron arsenides. So this triclinic phase acts kind of like the orthorhombic phase in the iron arsenide materials. And then there's a superconducting dome-like thing here. Um, the triclinic phase is split. There's a little bit of first order character and some hysteresis. And as you dope with cobalt, I guess I should call it substitution, but I think you understand what I mean. Uh, TC goes up to about 2.3 Kelvin. So JC apologized for the superconductivity being low temperature, but I'm going to show you the charge density wave set in at quite high temperature. So um, this material is actually sits somewhere halfway between the, um, the panictide superconductors and the transition metal dicalcogenides, things like tantalum disulfide and so on. Um, Okay, so um, the structure is similar, uh, but TC is much lower than the iron arsenides. And very important, nobody has seen magnet has found magnetic order in this material yet. There's been quite a few neutron studies and nobody has found antiferromagnetism. So there's been a question for a while, which is what exactly is this competing phase here? So the latest work from JP's group was this uh, strain, uniaxial strain response, which you just heard all about. And what he showed is near this triclinic transition, there's a region where the pneumatic susceptibility is extremely large. Um, overall, the phase diagram looks a lot like the cobalt phase diagram as well. Um, there's a first order quantum phase transition. So it's a quantum phase transition, but not a quantum critical point at 0.7, across which the triclinic phase disappears. And all along this boundary, there is a big pneumatic response. And then down here, that enhances superconductivity by a factor of six, which you just heard about in the previous talk. I want to point out a couple of things. The first is in this region here, the, the pneumatic response is hysteretic. Out here, there's still a big response, but it's reversible. So it looks like there's some kind of static order or domains forming in this region that become dynamic out here. And I, for me, when I look at this material the first time, I asked several questions. One is, 
um, what is going on with this strange superconducting state here? So um, if you, so JP just told you in this region, the thermodynamic and transport signatures of superconductivity are split. So the black points are where the resistive transition is and the blue is, is the specific heat. So just on the left side in the triclinic phase, this, these things are split. But if you, go, if you get rid of the triclinic distortion, everything sort of becomes normal. So the question is, what is it about this triclinic phase that is, that is um, making the superconductivity behave so odd? And also just in general, what is this competing object sitting here? If it's not antiferromagnetism, then what is it? So in my group, we do a lot of experiments using advanced spectroscopy, scattering at synchrotron facilities and stuff. Everything I show you in this talk was done on a lab source. So this is an instrument we built in our lab. I actually originally built this just to train graduate students how to do scattering before we took them to the synchrotron. But we, everything we found was uh, measured on this lab source. So it's just a molybdenum K-alpha microspot X-ray source with a liquid helium cryostat with a base temperature of four Kelvin with some beryllium domes and so on. And then we have a large area um, image plate detector. And um, so this thing lets you do full reciprocal space mapping. And before I get into the details, I wanna point out a subtlety. So in scattering, one always specifies momenta in terms of Miller indices, HKL. There are two different sets of Miller indices, depending upon whether you're in the triclinic phase at high temperature, uh, the uh, tetragonal phase at high temperature or the triclinic phase at low temperature. So it's crucial to index everything in the unit cell in the phase where it exists. So I'm gonna put a little subscript next to every HKL that says which crystal system we're indexing. So if you see a tetragonal there, that means the HK and L correspond to tetragonal, the tetragonal unit cell and triclinic is the triclinic unit cell. And just let me back up a second. So this is how we've defined them. So this, uh, in the high temperature phase, we use this orthorhombic unit cell. It's the normal one for the panictides. The triclinic state, we use the reduced cell, which is this one. Um, the only difference between these is, well, the main difference is, the, the only similarity between these two cells is that this barium atom is still crystallographically equivalent to this barium atom. But other than that, all the atoms become distinguishable at, in the low temperature state. Um, okay, anyway, so that's just the way we've defined it. Okay, so here's the main result. If you cool this stuff off, you see a superstructure. So these are some maps of momentum space. This is in the tetragonal phase. So if you look at, this is at 142 Kelvin. So this is just above the triclinic transition, which I think is at 136, if I remember correctly. I wrote that down somewhere, yes, 136 Kelvin. So what you can see is that there are some superstructure peaks that form. And this implies that there is a uh, super lattice in the crystal structure. It's not appropriate to call such a thing a charge density wave because there are a lot of different ways you can get a superstructure. But it's important to point out that you can see whatever these reflections are in multiple Bruon zones. So the thing that makes you know this is a real superstructure is that you can see these things all kinds of places in momentum space, which distinguishes it from little spots due to scattering from the beryllium domes or the, or the um, <clears throat> sample holder and so on. So whatever this thing is, it has a periodicity of 0 0.28. So it's incommensurate. That's the wave vector in tetragonal units. And it shows up quite a bit higher than the, the uh, triclinic transition. So you can start to see these things at 150 Kelvin. And then they get stronger and stronger as you cool. When you cool into the low temperature state, so this is, a, is a, also a cut in, um, but now in triclinic units, another charge density wave forms. And this thing has Q of one third zero zero in triclinic units. Okay, and this again is a coherent superstructure. You see it in many different Bruon zones. So it's a real supermodulation in the crystal. And the amplitude, we've done some estimates and it's something like somewhere between a few hundredths to a few tenths of an angstrom. So this is extremely large. It's the amplitude is actually similar to well-known structural charge density waves and things like tantalum diselenide, tantalum disulfide, the transition metal dichalcogenides are of the same order. So whatever this instability is, the electron phonon interaction is playing a, a critical role. Um, okay. But it is not a simple nesting. I, I, I have a backup slide on the, on the ARPES. So you, you don't get simple, you don't get Bruon zone folding and gaps opening like you would expect if it were a simple pyral state. So it's not a textbook thing, but the lattice is involved in some way. Okay, so Peter, the- you, Peter, 
Yeah. Do you mind being interrupted? Please. Um, so this notation 0 0.2800 or uh, no, uh, wait, wait, extra both and one third zero zero. Yeah. Uh, is that in the uh, nickel nickel bond direction or is it some other direction? Uh, it is in, I actually have a picture of the bronze. Oh, on thank you. Yeah. Um, it is at a, it is at a, it is an angle between the nickel. It's triclinic. So it's at, a, everything is at an angle. Um, let's see, but it's only triclinic in one direction. So you're asking, is it in, I think it's roughly 45 degrees between the nickel nickel bonds. Uh, okay, so it's rotated rotated away from, uh, what would it be the wave vectors, uh, the patterns of the magnetism in the ion systems? Um, yes, it's in the, I think if into trigonal units, you'd call this the pi pi direction. But I think okay, the magnetism is also pi yeah. pi. So, well, that's right. It's, it's stripe antiferromagnetism. Okay. Yeah, Thanks. this is 45 degrees. Um, yes, okay, so these two, this is very important. These two Qs look very similar. 0.28 is not far from one third, but this is triclinic units and this is tetragonal. So these are in very different locations in momentum space. So this is what the Bruan zones look like. The black is the Bruan zone in the tetragonal cell. The red is the triclinic cell, the way we defined it. And you can see there are two planes here. There's a gray plane, that's the HK plane in the tetragonal cell. The red is the HK plane in the triclinic cell. And so the, this incommensurate CDW at 0.28 is sitting in, at these two points in this gray plane. So those are at, so they're in this gray plane here. If you, uh, in the triclinic planes, this thing we call CCDW2 is sitting at this point. So even though the Miller indices are very similar, these two CDWs are about 20 degrees apart. So they're completely different charge density waves. Um, I can talk more about that if you like. So, but just, so don't let the indices fool you. They're really different. It's not a commensurate incommensurate transition. They're really completely different phenomena. Okay, so uh, not all structural modulations are charge density waves. For example, BISCO, if you know your high TC has a supermodulation, it has nothing to do with CDWs. It just has to do with the fact that the bismuth oxide layers and the copper oxide layers have different periodicity. So when you put them together in a crystal, there's internal strain and it relieves itself by, by creating a buckling. So that's called an adaptive misfit effect. So if you wanna prove this is a charge density wave, you need to do something else. The thing that really convinced me is that it exhibits what's called a lock-in transition. If you Look at the one third state at a temperature a little bit above, a little bit below the triclinic transition, so 129 Kelvin. You can see the wave vector actually shifts with temperature. So if I look at 136 K, this thing is sitting at around 0.31 in the H direction. But as I cool, it shifts continuously. And then at a certain temperature, TL, which is 129 Kelvin, it pins on the lattice to a wave vector that's exactly one third. So it's 0.333. So this kind of effect is sort of a smoking gun signature of a charge density wave. It also takes place in things like tantalum disulfide. You know, in tantalum disulfide at high temperature, if you know your dichalcogenized, there's an incommensurate CDW. You cool, there's a nearly commensurate CDW. That's, that's kind of like this. And then that thing locks into a commensurate wave vector below the low temperature transition. This thing exhibits almost a, a very similar phenomenology. So it's kind of like, so the material is sort of halfway between a panictide superconductor and a dichalcogenide in the sense that the way that in, in the way the charge density waves behave. Peter, uh, may I ask to clarify, this is Andrina Vidomsky. Um, when you index the peaks, are you taking the lattice wave vectors at whatever, the lowest temperature measured? I mean, are you, are you taking into account the thermal expansion? Yes, we take into account the thermal expansion. So the, the, the lattice parameters are temperature dependent, mm -hmm. not hugely, but a little bit. And every peak is indexed with respect to the lattice at that temperature. See, so the, the drift that, that you show here has nothing to do with the lattice slightly expanding. No, no. And that was crucial to, to prove that this is true. You have to normalize that effect out. Mm -hmm. It turns out if you don't correct for that, you can still see this because it's more than an order of magnitude bigger shift than, than what the lattice parameters do. So even if we didn't do that correction, you could still trust the result, but we did that correction. 
Thank you. Um, let's see. Yeah, so what this really tells you is that at high temperature, there's something determining what the Q vector is, something related to the Fermi surface or electronic structure in some way. And that's competing with the tendency of the CDW to pin on the lattice. So those two effects compete with each other. And then at high temperature, there's one Q and then it shifts and at low temperature, there's a, there's a, uh, a pinning effect. Okay, and I don't know how I'm doing on time, but um, I think I tried to make a 30 minute talk like JP. Um, okay, so uh, we spend a lot of time trying to understand whether this, these CDWs break rotational symmetry. This was especially important when um, Paglione group started to see pneumatic phenomena. So there's a question, is this, are these CDWs C4, they have rotational symmetry, or is it C2, meaning it's some kind of unidirectional order? So if you look at the CDW1 phase, that's the thing with the wave vector of one third, it is clearly unidirectional. So if you map, if you uh, do a wide mapping of momentum space, you can see all the reflections lie in the same direction. You never see the companion reflections rotated 90 degrees. So this is a one Q unidirectional um, state. Um, okay. Let's see, but it, and, and if it turns out that the incommensurate CDW is bi-directional, so this thing lives in the tetragonal phase above the tetragonal phase transition, and it is actually C4. Our original paper on this, which was published in 2019, was wrong. I think I can be a grown up and admit when I'm wrong. So I was wrong about this. And the reason I was wrong is actually quite subtle. If you look in a given Brulon zone, what you can see is that um, there are pairs of reflections and they're unidirectional. You only see a pair along the H direction or the K direction. So in some zones, you see them along H, some zones you see them along K. When we originally did the study, we only looked at a few Brouhan zones and they were all oriented along one direction. And what we concluded was it's a unidirectional CDW because you only see reflections in a certain way. But if you do a wider mapping of momentum space, which we went back and did, you can show that the actual pattern of reflections looks like this. So if you look in any given Brouhan zone, there are two reflections, but the overall pattern has fourfold symmetry. So even though the low temperature state is C2, it's a unidirectional state, in the high temperature state, in the incommensurate phase, it's actually C4. It's very important because the symmetry of this thing is different in the high temperature tetragonal phase than the low temperature phase. It kind of makes sense because it means that the system really is tetragonal, even when the CDW is present. So um, where are the other pairs of reflections? They're actually extinguished by symmetry. So this happens in crystals like, you know, in silicon, there's a 111 reflection and a 333 reflection, but there's no 222. It's forbidden by symmetry because there are two silicon atoms in a unit cell and they're identical. So there's some kind of internal symmetry in this modulation that extinguishes some of the reflections um, but anyway, the overall thing is, is C4. So that was incorrectly reported in our earlier paper, but it's corrected in the new one that was just posted. Okay, so if you dope with cobalt, this is the phase diagram that you get. So up here at, um, at uh, very light doping, there's this incommensurate phase. And then as you dope, everything gets suppressed. The incommensurate phase goes away and all the TCs of everything else disappears. This line is the... Um, is the incommensurate to commensurate transition. We call that TL, that's the lock-in line, and that goes to zero somewhere in the middle of this dome. Interestingly, there's an extended region of coexistence where you have both triclinic and tetragonal phases in part of the phase diagram. Down here at low doping, low substitution, it's purely triclinic, but at higher levels of co cobalt content, the two phases coexist. So it looks like there could be some kind of disorder or so on, but the CDW order is very long range. Okay, um, so what does this have to do with nematicity? So JP spent a few minutes telling us about um, barium strontium nickel arsenide, which is definitely not doping because barium, this is like pressure. Strontium is, is, uh, is above barium. So question is, what happens to these charge density waves in this system? And um, 
here's the result. So at low values of x, everything is the same. So there's an incommensurate phase. At x equals 0, it's the same material. At very small values of x, there's an incommensurate phase. There's a commensurate phase. The commensurate phase has wave vector 1 third. But as you continue to dope, something very surprising happens. At x greater than about a quarter, a third charge density wave appears. So it has a wave vector of one half. So it's one half zero zero in triclinic units. So if you take the material with a composition of 0.47 and just measure it as a function of temperature, it does something, it shows three different charge density waves as a function of temperature. I've studied charge density waves for 25 years. I've never seen this. So as you cool, this incommensurate phase forms and then that dies quickly and this period two, period three commensurate phase forms and then that dies and then a third CDW period two appears. And these three things seem to compete with one another. This is the advantage of being an experimentalist is I don't have to explain this. I can simply report that it's true. Um, the period two phase, if you do a wide momentum mapping and I can show you that if you like, is also unidirectional. And um, so it's at the high temperature state where the system is tetragonal, the CDW is also fourfold symmetric, but in the triclinic phase, everything becomes unidirectional. So you can have a conversation, is it unidirectional because the system is triclinic or is it triclinic because it formed a charge density wave that wanted to be unidirectional? And I don't know the answer to that question, but um, that's an interesting thing to investigate. Okay, so just to be clear, when I say they're all different CDWs, they really are in completely different locations in momentum space. So before I showed you, this is the incommensurate CDW in the tetragonal phase. This was the CDW1 in the tri triclinic phase. The CDW2 sits out here at the zone boundary. So they're really quite far apart. And um, they almost look like they're different kinds of instabilities that are just competing with one another. So the final phase diagram looks more or less like this. And we tried to put it together with the pneumatic response reported by Taglione et al. And uh, what you can see is that low doping, so this is the incommensurate phase here. This is the commensurate phase with period three. And as you dope, this period three CDW disappears and you get this period two state forming instead. And then the incommensurate phase at sufficiently high doping disappears. So I need to point out two things. The first thing is that everywhere you see the incommensurate CDW, the strain response is hysteretic. So if you remember when JP was showing you the pneumatic response, there was a region where he had these hysteresis loops but then if you dope far enough, they become reversible. There's still a big response there, but everything becomes reversible. The region where it's hysteretic is where this incommensurate CDW exists. And the region where the incommensurate CDW is gone, everything becomes reversible. So it looks like there are sort of pneumatic fluctuations in the system. And when the incommensurate phase forms, it pins them and they become static domains, which you can train like ferromagnetism and iron. So that raises some interesting questions, which is how does a thing that is fourfold symmetric pin an object with a pneumatic order parameter? Because they have different, those order parameters have different symmetry. So I don't know how you could couple two such things, but that seems to be what happens. The other thing is it provides a lot of insight into what this strange superconducting state was down in this region about 0.5 to 0.7. On the left side of this first order line, there was this odd superconducting phase where the thermodynamic and transport properties, the signatures of superconductivity are split. The resistive transition sets in and the thermodynamic trans transition is at lower temperature. That effect is entirely existent within this period two CDW phase. So I went and I talked to Eduardo Fradkin and he said that makes perfect sense because a charge density way with period two, the order parameter is always real because if, if it's period two, then the phase of the order parameter is always pi or minus pi. It, there's nothing else it can, no other value can take on. Or in other words, it's always just one or minus one. So if the order parameter is real, anytime you form a domain wall, the order parameter has to go to, the gap or the order parameter of the CDW has to go to zero. So if I have a period two CDW coexisting with a superconductor that it's competing with, then it should produce a filamentary state where you get superconductivity localized at domain walls in the charge order. 
And that's a possible explanation for this. So he has a theory of that that's in this, I won't, I can't explain all the algebra, but it's uh, in an extensive supplement in this paper we just put on the archive. Um, okay, so I'm done. I just wanna point out, we were inspired by JP. So we made a copy of his strain cell and we're now doing measurements of this material under uniaxial strain. And you can already see there's a big response. So if you measure this, these X-oriented and Y-oriented CDW reflections and you put the system under a strain of just a few times 10 to the minus three, then you can actually show that the, the two wave vectors, the incommensurate phase respond completely differently. So it looks like the incommensurate phase really feels uniaxial strain a lot. If you look in the commensurate phase, or even the crystal structure itself, it essentially doesn't care about strain at all. So there's some connection between the strain response of the system and the incommensurate state. Okay, so that's the end. Um, in summary, these materials are really exciting. I'm glad JP didn't give up. And I apologize for not taking an interest 10 years ago when he was first doing this. They do a lot of things like the iron arsenides um, is a similar, there's a structure, there's pneumatic phenomena, and there's some competing instability like antiferromagnetism. The only difference is it's a charge density wave. And the phenomenology, at least in the parent compound, is very similar to tantalum disulfide. So this is kind of like the panictide superconductors where you put some dichalcogenide physics in there. <laughs> it is definitely a lattice-driven CDW, but it's not a simple pyral state in the sense that the nesting vectors and such don't make sense. And whatever the incommensurate phase is, it seems to pin the pneumatic fluctuations leading to a hysteresis state. And this period two CDW is somehow responsible for the anomalous superconducting state they reported, perhaps through a domain wall mechanism Eduardo has proposed. And that's the end, thanks. Thank you very much, Peter, for this really interesting talk. I'm gonna ask my questions if you feel like I won't get to, great. Can I ask, you mentioned that you've seen, you have evidence from ARPES that shows it's not uh, a nesting driven? Yeah, um, uh, Dong Lai Fang's group in Fudan did, did a lot of RPES. I see, from that paper. And, and the other question, yeah. yeah, sorry. Oh, well, I'll just tell you, the only thing that happens is at, at low temperature, you don't see it, there's electron pockets, hole pockets. It's similar to the ar iron arsenides, but with the Fermi energy in a different mm -hmm. spot in the band. Mm -hmm. What happens at low temperatures, you get these little alpha pockets forming. You don't see a clear folding of the zone or a gap forming. You just get these extra pockets. The Q, the vector connecting them is the same as this triclinic Q vector. Why is that? I don't know, but um, yeah. The first thing you ask when you see a CDW is what's the Fermi service do and this is what it does. Okay. Sorry, can I just have, I'll ask another question before I let? Yeah. So uh, since Christoph mentioned that uh, there, there is a symmetry broken state uh, in the regime where there was an incommensurate charge density wave. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to explain the diffraction pattern by thinking there's domain mixing and then in each domain there's unidirectional CW to explain that? Um, I can only tell you we don't see any, we don't see any symmetry breaking in that phase. Um, there may be, we're not the only group working on this. There's a lot of x-ray data from groups in Karlsruhe and other places that have worked on this. Um, I'll show you what we see. So. If you just take uh, this, this point, you know, any of the materials and you cool, this is what the transition looks like. So in the high temperature state, there's nice sharp Bragg peaks. When you cool, they split into triclinic domains. And these are twin domains and you can measure their periodicity and everything. And all the data I showed you indexed is actually taking one of these satellite reflections and indexing a, a part of the crystal and calling that the so we pick one twin and index with respect to that. There isn't a phase in between that we could call orthorhombic, but you know, right at the phase transition, this thing has some funny shapes. Maybe you could try to index that as something else. Um, so this is what we get. Okay, thank you. Maybe then I'll let Christoph ask the first question. No, I was sort of uh, going the, in the same direction. Uh, um, actually, the, the uh, from from the uh, diffraction data in Karlsruhe, we also don't have evidence for the orthorhombic phase, but we do have evidence from the res uh, high resolution thermal expansion, uh, which is uh, much more sensitive than the X-ray diffraction. Yeah. So I think there's a very clear evidence for orthorhombic phase, and this uh, I think naturally would explain your hysteresis in this phase. You have domains. 
Um, yeah, okay, could be. So that would be, if that's a very tiny effect, it might be living in this peak here. And then it could be, yeah, I'd be really interested to see that data. The evidence is, well, it's on the archive. Huh? I on think the archive. You should add it to you, I think, you know? Okay. So I think the, yeah, the, the evidence for the orthorhombic phase is, is quite clear. Huh? There's a real phase transition, uh, which breaks the symmetry there. Yeah, I mean, it would make sense. It's really hard to go from tetragonal to triclinic P1 bar without yeah, yeah. going through any intermediate symmetries. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what we explained so, in the paper. Yeah, yeah that, would that would make sense. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Pang Chang, what's next? Uh, yeah. So, so, yeah. So, I have two questions. I guess so the first question is that, I mean, uh, the, what happens in the L direction, C direction? I mean, are all these things that you're talking about is in the, uh, I guess, the nickel plane, right? Nickel, nickel. No, 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 no. They're at an angle. Oh, they're at an angle. Okay. So, yeah. so are, there, are there periods along I mean, incompatibility, compatibility along C axis or? Well, it depends on what you mean. It's triclinic, so you can't, the, the, uh, the momentum space axes are not parallel to the real space axes in this material. Mm. So it depends on what you, whether you mean real space or momentum space. But if you take, say, for example, Q, this Q equals one third state, mm -hmm. all right? It is sitting at 20 degree angle with respect to the planes. But oh. that is the HK plane in reciprocal space because it's a triclinic cell. So you have to be careful what you mean. I see, I see. So, so did you, do you have a model? I mean, uh, you know, the sort of, what sort of lattice motion that give rise to these peaks? Or? No. <laughs> I it's don't. tough, right? It's tough. I right? don't. Yeah. Well, I, I, we started working on one. The key thing is this. You know, when you do crystallography, the most important reflections are the ones that are not there, mm -hmm. right? The ones that really constrain the symmetry are the ones that, are, that vanish, right? And... So to get them to vanish in exactly this pattern is a very strong constraint on what the real space picture of the CDW is. So we started playing with that and we didn't, we haven't figured it out yet. It's a math problem. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah. But if you, is it possible to decompose this into two, two domains in which? If theoretically, yes. So if I took all the horizontal ones and I called that a domain, and I rotated it 90 degree, degrees, I would get all the vertical ones. Mm -hmm. So it's not inconceivable you could explain it with domains, but it starts to be harder to believe. But, 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 but this can potentially be seen by electron diffraction, right? I mean, by using, you know, you, I mean, electron, which has a much smaller spot, right? And then you can separate the domains, right? Or yeah. yeah, that would be a really good idea to do that. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Mel. Yeah, beautiful talk. Um, so uh, I, I was wondering, Peter, um, actually maybe one comment and, and one question. Uh, in the comment is that in the process of understanding uh, some still evolving experiments in this heavily holdup ion uh, arsenides, uh, we actually thought about uh, how to link you know, any density wave fluctuations uh, at some particular cues, uh, how would that connect with uh, the type of nematicity? And the statement is that so long as the density wave fluctuations are away from the ion ion bond direction, you have a chance of getting uh, nematicity that's 45 degrees rotated away from you know the, the direction that's picked by in the ion. Uh, yeah. In usual ion arsenide cases. Oh, okay. So, so it seems to me that uh, uh, you have all these, you know, various kind of static CDW orders that would imply that should be there should be fluctuations. Uh, on, yes, I was going to talk about different cues, and some of which could uh, be linked uh, with the uh, pneumatic order that's seen. Uh, 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 in, in, uh, uh, I guess in this uh, strontium uh, barium cases. Yeah. Um, so that's a common. Uh, the question to you is that uh, if the link is with the magnetic order, then there's neutron data that tells us how much spectral weight uh, is living there in the fluctuating part, a different Q, different uh, omega. Yeah. For this kind of CDW type of, um, uh, in, in, in this uh, CDW channel, 
how much information can you get experimentally for the inelastic uh, spectrum and and also like how to quantify the total spectral weight that's living in the fluctuating part i mean we can okay i have several answers the first answer is I have a hunch, I can't prove it, but I believe this incommensurate phase is dynamic. Mm -hmm. And I, I need a different plot, but one thing this doesn't show is that this blue line is about a factor of 50 smaller than the purple, and the purple is about a factor of 10 smaller than the green. Yeah. So what really is happening is as you cool toward the triclinic transition, there's some fluctuations that are building up at a wave vector of 0.28, like it wants to form that phase and it's still dynamic and hasn't asserted itself, but before it can form, it gets preempted by another phase transition with a different order. And then this thing is really static. Some very low frequency fluctuations, presumably. Yes, I can't, well, this is an energy integrated measurement, but. I see, okay. I bet, that, yeah. So, okay, then so the answer to the second question is, can you get dynamic information? Yes, absolutely. We haven't done it, but. And then the collective modes of this material would be analogous to the spin excitations in the panictides. The difference here is, you know, now the collective excitations are acoustic phonons. And the question is, are the phase on and amplitude on modes consistent with any common understanding of CDWs? And that's something we need to do. But can, can, how, how much, I mean, it's, a, it's a, my ignorance about the, uh, uh, dynamical measurement in the charge sector. So in the spin sector, one can say, oh, you know, I get the total spectral uh, in a fluctuation to be say five Bohr magnetons square per ion or some such numbers. Yeah. Uh, in the charge sector, it's the same. way to calibrate. Yeah, we did that. That you can get from an energy integrated measurement. That's where okay. this, where did it go? This statement came from the analogous thing in the charge sector. So what you get is instead of the local moment, you get the local displacement amplitude of the structural distortion. I see. So how do you relate this to a charge amplitude? That's another experiment. You have to use resonance techniques to do that. And mm -hmm. You can quantify these things separately, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then Andre? Uh, Peter, uh, first, if you allow me to make a quick comment, and then I'll, I'll, I'll ask the question. So the comment is about, um, I haven't read uh, Eduardo's paper, but just from what you told us, if indeed the superconductivity sort of sits on the domain walls, which are periodic in real space, yeah, that means that upon Fourier transformation, there should be a K structure to this gap. So let's say you're inside the triclinic phase, there's a well-defined uniaxial direction of the charge density wave. Well, then it wouldn't be delta, it wouldn't be just a constant in K space. It would be, it would look like something like delta naught time cosine of Q times R, where Q is corresponding vector. So in other words, what I'm saying is that if true, then it would look like FFLO state, literally. Yes. Or PDW, maybe. Right, or right, except yeah, or PDW if you wish. And so yeah. if so, then then this goes back to the question I was asking um John Pierre is whether or not it's possible to then try to tease that information out either from laser ARPUS or STM QPI or some form of you, you know, kind of information. Okay, let me just be clear. It, there's no evidence that the domain walls are ordered. So the, oh. the CDW has a well-defined periodicity, but the information about the domain walls is embedded in the momentum space structure of that peak. Oh, so then I beg your pardon. So you're saying domain wall, I shouldn't interpret this as a twice periodic, you know, it's not 2A. It, it is 2A, but we don't know what the, that's the period of the CDW. The period right. of the domain walls is something unknown. Oh, so it's I mean, not that, okay. There is disorder, so there certainly have to be domain walls, but we don't know anything about the structure of those. Okay, so the domain walls, then I misunderstood. So the main walls is some macroscopic object, right? It's not related to 2A. It's right. not the internal. It's not related to 2A. Okay, well then what- And Eduardo's is... theory assumes those things are randomly distributed. So you have some- So then of course you wouldn't get any Q dependence. Okay. Right. Now it, we haven't proven that they're not ordered. You know, this is not a high resolution measurement. We just did this in the lab. So if we go back with high resolution, if you know, there are materials where you, where like titanium diselenide in the superconducting state, that thing actually becomes incommensurate because there are periodic domain walls that form. Mm -hmm. And it's very similar. So very similar, this stuff happens in the dichalcogenides, it's, it's known. 
So what we need to do is go and measure that thing at high resolution and see if the peak is split or shifted. Mm -hmm. And that would tell you that the domain walls were ordered. And then it really would be some PDW or FFLO kind of phase. Like, mm -hmm. So I can't tell you that doesn't happen. And, and it's known to happen in other things. Gotcha, gotcha. And, and now as for my question uh, related to the earlier discussion of whether or not the 0 0.28 in commensurate phase, right, what you call CDW1, yeah, was it not... Right. Uh, no, sorry, let me take it back. The tetragonal one, the incommensurate CDW. Yeah. The one in the orange, correct. So yeah. the question of whether or not it's truly a statement of having two kind of domain walls and then what you see is an aggregate summary, um, or was it something dynamic as you implied that it may be fluctuating? Would you be able to distinguish between the two by applying that uniaxial pressure setup that you discussed? Yeah, and we did. What do you think would be the difference for these two scenarios if you apply uniaxial pressure? Um, the older I get, the more I measure first and think second. And so I've deliberately not spent too much time assuming what it's going to do, and we're just measuring it. So here's what happens. So the red, this is this intense. If you measure the intensity of these two different satellites with different orientation as a function of temperature, they have identical temperature dependence. But if you put the system under uniaxial strain, they become different. So the X Fourier component of the density and the Y Fourier component of the density in the incommensurate phase respond extremely differently to strain. One gets stronger and the other one gets weaker. This could be explained in a domain picture or in a four, or you could say I have a fourfold symmetric CDW that's on the brink of becoming something unidirectional. And then when I apply some strain, it responds greatly. So it doesn't prove which one it is, but it, there may be a, with a model and some careful analysis of this data, we may be able to figure that out. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, effect is not monotonic. Like it only. Can I maybe ask a question because uh, it looks like you don't see me, uh, uh, Peter? Uh, uh, this is a kind of layer system. So uh, in the diagonal phase, uh, the charge density wave is essentially in plane. Yeah. Uh, this uh, one third in uh, trigonal setting. Uh, this Q vector is it in plane still or it's actually three dimensional? I can't see you, but you sound like Daniel Komsky to me. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, you're supposed to see me. I, at least I see me. I see myself. It's good to see you, sir. What, what, I'm sorry, can you ask it again? I see myself. Well, uh, the question is the following, that uh, in the diagonal phase, CDW is essentially in plane, like yeah. in the Dicoagonite. Exactly. In uh, uh, these trigonal, uh, so triclinic phase, sorry, not trigonal, triclinic phase. Uh, this yeah. one third wave vector, is it still in plane geographically, so to say, or no. it's connecting different planes? It's 20 so degrees it's, canted with respect to the plane. So it's at an angle. So it's connecting, it's more three dimensional essentially. Everything is three dimensional. It's a completely 3D charge density wave. Mm -hmm. So isn't, no... it, isn't it possible that that's exactly why it's uh, really different because uh, if I understand from the first talk uh, in triclinic phase, distance between layers becomes uh, much shorter, more. So the system becomes uh, essentially uh, more three-dimensional. Is it possible that it's- I don't Z? think so. The, 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 the size of the change is very tiny. The structure displacement is very small. I don't know about the dimensionality. I mean, JP may have some anisotropic transport data. That I haven't seen, but you know when we the the unit cell that you pick changes hugely, but the atoms don't move much, right? So right, so it, the angles change a very tiny amount. I forget how much when you go from tetragonal triclinic. So you just pick a different cell when you describe the diffraction because you have to, right? But at least that's significant physical difference between these two different CDW. One of Absolutely. them is essentially in plane. And the other one is uh, uh, actually so it's, uh, not really two D phenomena. Yeah. It's so in other words, so uh, there's a very very small structural distortion, some hundredths of an angstrom or something, and then when that forms, the CDW rotates twenty degrees. That's essentially. I actually wanted in the beginning uh, to ask a question which you ask yourself. 
uh, what is again an egg problem. Uh, uh, be, uh, whether this uh, triclinic is driven by uh, the different CDW or it's simply modified. So is there, is there any way uh, experimentally to uh, somehow just to try to influence them, either hydrostatic pressure or magnetic field or whatever, anything to try to, uh, yeah. to, to modify uh, and to see whether they will go together or not? Yes. Okay, let me tell you this. When you apply uniaxial strain, it's sort of the few times 10 to the minus four level. The CDW responds a lot, but the crystal structure doesn't care. You cannot move the triclinic transition with uniaxial strain. It doesn't move, but the CDW changes a lot. I don't know if that answers the question, but... Well, at least it's some hint. <laughs> it's a hint, yeah. I, to be honest, I you shouldn't be asking me that. I probably should be asking you, so... Okay, very good. Thanks. I uh, see JP, you have your hand up and you want to ask a question or? Yeah, thanks. Uh, more of a comment just about the uh, domain wall elementary superconductivity. Um, you know, it's just, I'm just pondering because it's, if you think about, uh, okay, there's some competing phases, charge order and superconductivity. And so you might consider that superconductivity lives where the charge order doesn't. So you get an enhanced TC, at least you know some partial uh, volume of filamentary. And that TC seems to be the same as just up to the right of the quantum phase transition. So you know, naively, they should be the same kind of superconductivity. Uh, but there's, you know, the question is, what about the nematicity? You know, so if I think about the right side where there's no triclinic or charge order or anything and the statement about the TC enhancement due to some pneumatic fluctuation, um, is that the same enhancement that's happening just to the left along these domain walls or is it something different? Right, so this yeah, is yeah. just, yeah, I, I don't know what to think about it. I think true. that's the key question. Yeah. It, what, why? If this is due, if this TC enhancement is due to some fluctuations, why do those fluctuations live on both sides of this phase boundary? Exactly. When exactly. one side is ordered and the other one is not. Right. So Especially because there's a sort of first order transition between them. So that's yeah. very strange. Yeah. So whatever is the first order in this doesn't look that strong. Uh, that that would be one possibility. Correct. Yeah. Well, there's definitely fluctuations here, so it's got some second orderness going on. Certainly, the 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 bulk superconducting transition has a very abrupt jump. Okay, does that's my call. Yeah. Does the TC respond to strain in that overdub region? That's a question for JP. Um, I don't think we've. We have not explored it, no. We're actually doing pressure experiments now to see, to try to pass through this transition region. But we've been held up by some practical issues in, in doing the experiment, but we're doing it right now, actually. So you can see I mean, if, if one ignores uh, uh, the notion that uh, it's PCS electron Oh, or maybe electron phonon driven is fine. Um, uh, if uh, if the fluctuation is in the charge uh, uh, density sector, phonons uh, by symmetry uh, mixed in. So uh, maybe the whole notion still is uh, that you know you have a dome and uh, uh, the pairing symmetry is uh, not that much important. Uh, you you so long as the first order, it's not that. Uh, really gigantic first order phase transition, you still have significant amount of quantum fluctuation, uh, some fluctuations, uh, which uh, I guess Peter can uh, see, uh, a, a, and that would uh, uh, presumably uh, uh, be uh, adequate to cause uh, a dawn. So the statement would be that there's charge fluctuations all across here. Yeah. And uh, the pneumatic response is secondary to that. In some sense, well, you might is part of a story. Uh, it's, yeah, like, it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, so still, we have to look for charge fluctuations around eighty percent. It, it seems naively. Yeah. 
So I think probably the phonons do something really strange here mm -hmm. at the Q vector of the CDW. Yeah, but that, one, could do, one could do, one could identify which phonons uh, by symmetry allow to couple to these kind of charge density fluctuations. Y yes. Yeah, that's a, that, by the way, that's a problem. Yes, I think I already mentioned that. If the, if the, if the incommensurate phase is really C4, it's hard to explain why it's coupling to the pneumatic mm -hmm. order, right? Because then they, are, the, they have different symmetry. No, but the C4, could it be just a mixture? It's like a two Q. Now the underlying, uh, there's still a Q, which uh, like in FETE, which is pointed along uh, some, Diagonal direction, uh, and uh, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the order or, or 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 what you see ends up with a two Q that's mixed up or, or several Qs. I guess you have a more comp complex complex uh, uh, Q landscape. So, yeah, uh, I think you have to sit down and yeah, because yeah. the the row is modulated at Q. So I think right. you have to sit down and write down a Landau theory and see what you can Absolutely, make, yeah. make invariant. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to say one thing for the neutron scatterers if Peng Cheng is still here. Oh, I'm here, I'm here, yeah. People Listen. looked hard for anti-ferromagnetism anti in this stuff. No, no, we, we looked as well. Like I said, you know, my, yes, one of the students, uh, he never, we never published anything, yeah. Did you look only around Pi Pi? No, we, we, we did a powder measurement. This is, so this is like more than 10 years ago when the, this was first done, this was first done by the uh, Los Alamos group, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so we quickly looked at it. We're actually using their sample I mean, we've seen nothing. So we, well, we, just, so we just kept silent, yeah, after that. I mean, it would be worth doing, I think the charge gives you some hint of a better place to look. I mean, of course, the powder looks everywhere simultaneously, but if you want to do a more targeted experiment, if the charge and the spin are coupled, then the wave vector of the spin should be half that of the charge. Yeah. yeah there, there which be means you should look yeah, yeah. here, right? Yeah, there should be, there should be some phonon softening. I mean, if, if there's a, if you form a, you know, black peak, then there's some, some phonons should soften at, at the position. Absolutely. Where you see black peak. So, so now we have single crystals. So it might be interesting to do some single crystal in your last measurement. Yeah. yeah. And I, I would go look here and see if there's a magnetic reflection in oh. a crystal. It's, it's pretty dead as far as my antenna is concerned. Yeah, you don't think it's there? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I, I would have published it if I, you know. <laughs> I mean, it, it, has, it has nickel. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but nickel nickel can be non-magnetic. <laughs> it can, it can. But there's a question: Is it non-magnetic because it's it's D eight nickel and it's spin one and the spins are disordered, or is it non-magnetic because it's not spin it's one and something spin. else? Yeah, right. Cool. So I those mean, are maybe, very different things. Maybe the best thing to do is to look, you know, to to get Tomo Yumura look at with Miosar. Miosar is much more sensitive than. Yeah, that there. would be. Doubt, that's actually a really good idea. Yeah, I doubt I doubt that there's anything there. I mean, yeah. Management-wise, yeah, but, but certainly oh, phonons are very interesting. Oh, 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 could could Angamar be interesting? Yeah. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. I don't understand NMR, but no, but it should it pick up anywhere in the Q space? Yeah, it's Q integrated. Mm -hmm. So maybe you see something in the spin relaxation. I mean, we already yeah. know the magnetic susceptibility knows about the CDW forming, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So Angamar is actually the sort of a very natural experiment to do. Yeah. I think yeah. NMR was done, but I have to look. I, it's been a long time. Yeah, yeah. NMR and MIOSAR will be interesting. I mean, yeah. But, but yeah. that basically rules out my, any magnetism. Yeah. So I think Amir has been patiently raising his hand. Do you, you want to ask a question? Uh, yeah. So very nice, very nice talk, uh, Peter. I have a question regarding going back to your, um, to the, uh, uh, phase uh, uh, boundary where you have this tetragonal to the orthorhombic phase transition. So um, you said you said you said in the beginning that um, the um, not everything where you have this super uh, reflection is a charge density the charge density wave. I I agree with that. But crystallographically, if you want to describe the lattice and the symmetry. Um, with all the weak positions, taking into account the reflections, obviously for the refinement, you don't take into account this um, uh, incommensurate um, uh, reflections. Exactly. So now, um, so that is crystallographically. 
So if we now say that this is crystallographically um, belonging to a tetragonal phase, I have a problem with that because, first of all, it is incommensurate. And actually, I would have expected if it would be the one third reflection, I could do something in, in uh, uh, defining a different cell. But yeah. in this case, how could you actually define a cell when you have an incommensurate um, wave vector? You, so yeah, you, you already, if you, if you say it's incommensurate in a tetragonal phase, I would say that's a charge density wave, unless you come up with something else. <laughs> I mean, it's a it's a fair point. If it's a if it's a truly incommensurate, the unit cell is infinite, and then crystallography yes. doesn't even make any sense. And there's, if you really want to get into crystallography, there's a super space group formalism that was developed in the '90s by Sandra von Smolen and others, where they you know generalized the concept of a space group to things with with the uh, yes. commensurate phases. And they actually refined the structure of tantalum disulfide doing that. It's kind of a brilliant set of papers from the late 90s. You would have to, if you want to do it right, you would have to index this using that framework, which is sort of beyond space groups. Exactly. But I mean, <laughs> as an experimentalist, what I do is I just say, well, I'm going to call it tetragonal <laughs> anyway, and then just show that the peaks sit in strange locations that don't index. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, you're yeah, you're okay. totally right. Okay. Any other? I see there was uh, Daniel Komsky made a comment in the chat. I don't know if we want to. Chat. Read. How do I get to that? Well, I can read it to you. Too. Here it is. No, I got okay. your pink plane in triclinic cells tilted by twenty degrees would affect the great tetragonal one. Yes. But the CDW wave vector could still be in plane parallel to intersection of these planes. Where is it in reality? It is in, it is in the tilted plane. So this pink plane, well, I called it red, but okay, it's pink. Salmon is tilted 20 degrees with respect to the crystal, the bonds, the planes, and the CDWs lie in this plane. So they're tilted with respect to the crystal lattice, but they're not tilted with respect to the reciprocal lattice. No, I understand, is... but uh, it's still tilted with respect to uh, just uh, basic tetragonal uh, crystal axis. Yes. With, with respect to nickel nickel distances, uh, direction, sorry, and so on, yeah? Yes, okay. exactly. So it's really 3D. It's really 3D. Okay, good, very good. Any other questions? We. <laughs> Uh, Great questions. This has been really interesting. Um, P Peter, can I, sorry, just before, so does the, how big is the triclinic domains? Do you, do you have any way of? Mm, I don't know. Okay. Too, too big for us to see on our lab source. I see. I think uh, whoever it was said somebody should do E-beam diffraction in a TEM, that's, that would be the way to do it. And you do, when you add strain, do you see a response in the domain uh, population? The, the triclinic domains? Yeah. No, yeah. nothing. Okay. Triclinic cell doesn't care about strain at all. Only the incommensurate CDW. And the commensurate CDWs also don't care. I see. Okay, thank you. There's no other, any other questions? This has been, thank you both uh, JP and Peter very much for this really interesting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. Yes, that was uh, my pleasure.